we can have some fun with this one, hopefully. <clears throat> Always do an interesting character. Always tell people here in Georgia, we we had two General Shermans, believe it or not. We have the one that everyone would like to forget, and we have the one most people have never heard of, and you're looking at. The one, obviously, that a lot of people might forget is Major General William Tecumseh Sherman, who conducted the Atlanta Campaign and the March to the Sea. This is Brigadier General Thomas Sherman, no relation to Tecumseh Sherman. Thomas Sherman, among several other things, was instrumental in landing federal troops carried ashore by the U.S. naval ships putting boots on the ground, taking possession of Tybee Island. If you've ever been to Tybee, you leave Tybee, drive back up toward Fort Pulaski, which will be on your right. All the way from Tybee up to the fortification, out to your right, you see marsh and swamp and alligators, and there's turtle crossing signs. Out in that marsh, they, after they landed on Tybee, they started bringing artillery pieces, again, off the heavy ships, off the coast, putting on landing boats, bringing them, putting them on Tybee, taking toward this marshy area. The soldiers built wooden platforms. And I found this not too long ago, so this is not, this part's not in the book. I ran across an officer's account who reported to this gentleman and he was talking about dragging these artillery pieces. I mean, think about this, ladies and gentlemen. We're wading out in the water that's this deep. There's alligators swimming around. And we've got a cannon that weighs several tons. It took 250 soldiers per cannon to drag them out through that marsh and then lift them up. They didn't have cranes. Uh, lift them up and park them on those wooden platforms they built. But the end result of all that is they were able to get the heavy artillery, the rifle guns, being able to fire a rifle shell that comes out with the muzzle of the tube of the gun, the shell spinning. And for the first time in this country, we learned after the War of 1812, everybody knows what happens when the British burned Washington, wreaked havoc up and down the Atlantic coast. We basically had no fortifications. So after the War of 1812, uh, Congress appropriated money to start building all these fortifications, including Fort Sumter and Charleston Harbor and Fort Pulaski, uh, just outside Savannah. And up until this point in time, they thought that these forts, brick and mason forts, would hold up against anything. And they would have up until these heavy, uh, and there's some on display here, these heavy artillery pieces, rifle, with the great accuracy, high velocity. If you've seen the walls of Fort Pulaski after it was bombarded for a day and a half, it looked like a piece of Swiss cheese. So all of a sudden they found out that the days of brick and mortar fortifications are gone, sort of reminiscent of the Battle of Hampton Roads uh, when the USS Monitor battled the CSS Virginia, and that literally instantly changed naval warfare forever. Because we're not going to build wooden ships anymore. The new thing is iron or steel, and that directly led to the modern vessels we have in the Navy and, and other branches of the service today. Uh, you'll see the same image down on the wonderful Georgia display, and I'm so happy that the museum was able to get the pieces, and I hope you get a bunch more. Uh, and Jeff mentioned down there, we really don't know what the Georgia looked like. And it, it's always shocked me, and I've run across this in several things in the course of my research over the years. I'm, I'm telling you, this was like, this would be, you know, Last year, I'm not a huge baseball fan, I'm a big football fan. You know, Braves won the World Series. I mean, everybody in Georgia was talking about that, certainly. This was almost comparable. 
This was a big deal. The ladies gunmen, the women of Georgia, starting in Savannah, and it branched far and wide. They even got contributions from other states. I can't stress, when they launched the Georgia, this was front page news everywhere. This was a major deal. The state of Georgia was incredibly proud of this crime. So I find it impossible to believe no one took a photograph of it. I, I have to believe there were photographers in Savannah, my goodness. I have to believe, and hopefully they'll turn up, Jeff, one of these days. Somebody's at it. Go home and look. You got a trunk in the attic. It might be in there. There was a hoax that popped up a few years ago. Some of you know about that. So we really don't know exactly what the Georgia looks like. This sketch, uh, period sketch, was done based on people who saw the boat. Uh, unfortunately, where she was built, the plans, I don't know if they destroyed them or if they were lost or Sherman captured Savannah in December of 1864, uh, if they were destroyed at that point in time. But just to indicate quickly, and I will, I meant to point out on one of the previous slides, and I failed to do so. Let me do that before I read this quote. The stages of, of the moon. You'll find, let me see if I can just back up quickly here and not mess this up. See out the side of the date, that's a full moon. And I was fortunate enough to find that Tybee Island, original copies of Greer's Almanac. I promise you, if we lived anywhere in the state of Georgia in that part of the 19th century, we would have had a copy of Greer's Almanac in our home. So I put the stages of the moon in there. Uh, from new moon to first quarter to uh, always get them out of order, full moon, last quarter, you know what I'm talking about. When I sent that to the publisher, Mark Jolly, wonderful editor, he called me and he said, why in the world do you want the stages of the moon in this book? I've never seen that before. And I said, listen, Mark, knowing the stages of the moon, if we're getting ready to lead troops into battle, um, against Wilson's Raiders when they came over in early 1865. Most of the fighting over on the other side in Bernard or Girard, Alabama at the time, Phoenix City today. I promise you Wilson knew, because most of the fighting took place at night. I would have to look it up. I don't know off the top of my head what the stage of the moon was that night. But depending upon what you and I were doing, military officers kept track of how much darkness you're going to have or how much light you're going to have. So it's important on land. It was mission critical on the coast. The Confederate officers and the United States officers on board the ships off the coast of Georgia, I promise you when they got out of bed, first thing every morning they could tell you high tides, low tides, stage of the moon. Um, it was critically important because and for blockade runners, for example, if you and I are going to risk, we just spent a few thousand dollars buying this boat. We're hoping to make a fortune. Supposedly, if you could make two successful runs out of Savannah to either Bermuda or the Bahamas or Cuba, those were the three destinations generally. If you could go to one of those points, load up your boat, bring it back in with all types of goods, that were needed here in the state and sell those, if you could do that twice, you paid for your boat and made quite a bit of money. If you do it three times or four times, you are an incredibly wealthy individual. So I promise you the blockade runners, if we're all on board one of these boats and Jeff is the skipper of the boat and we're gonna to try to run the blockade, I promise you he's gonna do it when there is a new moon. Why? Because it's dark. We can have stealth moon, so to speak. So this, that's why the stages of the moon are in the book. I've lost a lot of my mind, but I haven't totally lost all my mind. And then after I told the editor that, he was like, I get it now, I get it. it makes total sense, perfect. 
So I want to read this, uh, and this is so appropriate given the special uh, ceremonies this evening. Here we are in Columbus. We got some of, some of the relics of the CSS Georgia right down below us. This is from the Columbus Daily Sun, July 11, 1862, which was a Friday. And by the way, it was also a full moon. Probably, probably didn't have any bearing on this. And this newspaper uh, was writing a story on the ladies who had started the efforts to raise the money to build this boat. And this just goes, hopefully, uh, a little closer to capturing how truly important the CSS Georgia was. The editor said, quote, to your patriotic and noble efforts, Ladies of Georgia is the port of the city of Savannah indebted for this powerful engine for its defense against the hateful foes who are committing depredations upon our defenseless coasts. And the stories just went on and on and on. That's just one example from here in Columbus. It was all over the state. Like I said, the launching of the CSS Georgia was front page news. You know, years later, it'd be like the sinking of the Titanic or something. Um, opposite type of, that was bad news, this was good news. You can't talk about the war in Georgia without talking about the Atlanta campaign. I'm not going to belabor the issue. Uh, this is a period illustration that was done. The gentleman mounted on horseback with his back toward us um, is Major General William Tecumseh Sherman. And Sherman is looking out at the distance. Um, this is Ringgold Gap, the gap you see in the mountain range. Sherman is looking at some of the early May activity. This happened to be May 8th of 1864. Some of the opening salvos of the 1864 Atlanta campaign, which would culminate with the capture of Atlanta on September 2nd. And as I went through the book, I tried my best, and it's hard to do sometimes, but we've all read books and we've seen this quote, and you say to yourself, if I read this quote again, I'm going to scream. You know, it's a quote that's been printed in a thousand books. And there's a few of those in there. I mean, you can't do a book and Sherman capturing Savannah and telling President Lincoln, I beg to present you a Christmas gift, the city of Savannah. I mean, you can't leave that out, although it's been in probably 5,000 books. But I tried to look for those more obscure sources and things you don't read about, maybe ever. And I found a diary by a young Confederate pioneer soldier. His name was Hiram Williams. Well, you might say, what does a pioneer soldier do? Pretend this is a wartime road off to my right, your left, dirt road, and we're watching the pioneer soldiers march by. They're not carrying rifles. They're carrying shovels, axes, saws, picks. Their job is to open up the avenues of approach for the armies behind them, cutting down trees. If we have a lot of wagons in tow, uh, ambulance wagons, supply wagons, et cetera, et cetera, artillery pieces. You have to open up a way through the wilderness for those things to move. So that's what the pioneer soldiers did. Did pioneer soldiers get killed during the war doing their job? Absolutely. Map makers got killed. Photographers got killed. Newspaper reporters got killed. You didn't have to be carrying a rifle to die when there's people shooting all around you. So young Williams, and he's talking about this high ground on the right. This is Rocky Face Ridge. If you get on Interstate 75 today and drive north from Atlanta to Chattanooga, when you get up to Dalton, you can't miss it. It's on the right-hand side of 75. Huge mountain range, sheer rock face, thus Rocky Face Ridge. Young Williams is somewhere up on top of that, actually off of this particular period woodcut. And this is what he had to say about his work on May the 8th, which, by the way, was a Sunday. Why were they working? 
because the Federals were attacking. So sometimes things did have to happen out of necessity, even though it was the Sabbath. And William said, had to go and assist some artillery to get on the top of Buzzard Roofs. Had a hard time of it. When on the top of the mountain, we had a fine view of the field below us. Very similar probably to the view that Sherman has here, although he's looking in the opposite direction from Williams. Williams goes on to say that the enemy skirmishers were advancing across the fields in plain view. It was a grand sight and I could have looked for hours at them had not other work interfered. I'm almost done. We doing okay on time? No. Uh, um, <laughs> well, my watch keeps changing because we're right here on the eastern and central. So if I step this way, it tells me it's, it's 7.29, and if I step over here, it says it's 8.29. So I don't know what time it is. Um, this is one of George Barnard's photographs. Thank goodness that Sherman, after he captured Atlanta, sent a telegraph to the War Department in Washington and said, send me a photographer. There were photographers in Atlanta, but, but as the armies got closer and closer, they packed up all their equipment and got out of Dodge because they don't want to lose everything as the federal armies come in. There happened to be a civilian who was working under contract to the United States War Department. His name was George Barnard. Barnard was closest to Sherman in terms of geography. He was in Nashville. So they sent Barnard to Georgia about a week after Sherman captured Atlanta. And Sherman didn't leave Atlanta to begin the march to the sea until the middle of November. So Barnard had over two months Obviously, he was not a lazy man. He packed up all of his equipment, borrowed some wagons from the Army, and took his photography equipment all the way back up as far as Chattanooga and photographed various battlefield sites of the Atlanta campaign, places like Resaca, New Hope Church, and Kennesaw Mountain, and Peachtree Creek, etc., etc. This is uh, one of the photos. He took many in Atlanta. By the way, all these are digitized and they're on the Library of Congress website. This is not Carrie Berry's house, but it certainly could have been. Carrie Berry was a young girl in 1864, in August of 1864. She was 10 years of age. I remember when my daughter was 10. I'm not going to age yourself and age myself and tell you how many years ago that was. Um, but I can remember when she was 10. I cannot fathom her in the floor of her bedroom with shells bursting all around. This home was not too far from where she lived. You can see it's been struck. The only thing left are the chimneys because the rest of the home was wood and it burned. So typically the chimneys were the only thing still standing. And her diary basically is the entire month of August of 1864. And around the, early, the beginning of August is when Sherman ordered his three armies to bring up their, their artillery pieces. And they bombarded the city of Atlanta all day, every day, nonstop. So I can only I shudder when I think about this little girl and what must have been going through her mind. But we're very appreciative that she kept this wonderful diary. Uh, this is the uh, next to the last slide. Post-war now, January 17, 1865, which happened to be a Saturday. Uh, unfortunately, our nation had a new president, our 17th president, Andrew Johnson, because President Abraham Lincoln was assassinated in Ford's Theater on Good Friday in 65. Andrew Johnson, new president, no relation to this man, James Johnson. James Johnson was a native Georgian. Prior to the war, he had held virtually every elected position that Georgia could bestow upon anyone. He was very highly respected. 
Uh, you know, Andrew Johnson gets a lot of criticism, some of it very deserved. But I think Andrew Johnson, President Andrew Johnson, was pretty smart in appointing this man, and he had a very difficult task ahead of him. Governor, provisional governor, James Johnson, Johnson was tasked with, everybody get ready, we gotta go vote again. We've gotta elect delegates to go back to Milledgeville, and they have to write a new state constitution and they have to ratify the 13th Amendment. And we elect our representatives to go to Congress in Washington. So all that work's done. James Johnson oversaw all of that. So I think President Johnson was smart in tapping a native Georgian and a trusted man to oversee all of this. Eventually, during this same meeting, they appointed a permanent governor of Georgia, Charles Jenkins. I don't have his image shown, it's in the book. But um, So all that work's done. We developed a new state constitution, we ratified the 13th Amendment, and we elect our representatives, and they all board the trains and travel to Washington. And they show up at the Capitol, and most of the other members of Congress said, we don't think so. Among others, one of the individuals that Georgia had elected to take a seat in the Senate and represent Georgia was Alexander Stevens, the former vice president of the Confederacy. So that went over like a lead balloon in Washington. And there were some things about the state constitution that didn't please them. So they sent everybody home. You got to go back and do it all over again. So we go back and we do it all over again. We elect new representatives to go to Washington. We're writing another constitution. This time we have to ratify the 14th Amendment. They send them back. They get to Washington. You know, nobody called it Washington, D.C. in those days. Did y'all know that? Everybody called it Washington City. Nobody called it Washington, D.C. You can go through the newspapers, the official documents, war reports, naval reports. Very seldom do you see it referred to as Washington, D.C. It's Washington City. So they all go back. Same story. Not good enough. You got to go and do it all over again. So it wasn't until the middle part of 1870 that Georgia had jumped through every hoop put in front of her and finally did yet another constitution, sent elected representatives to Washington City, and the people in the Senate said, okay, you can come on in and take your seats. We approve this. And I'm sure they were thinking, fine. And Georgia, as I mentioned earlier, was the last state, by a pretty good measure, former Confederate state, to be readmitted to the United States of America.